Hi, I'd like to welcome everybody. My name is Bill Klingberg with SCORE, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, after Bobby uh, tells you a little bit about HCC. Who's letting us use this one? Well, so welcome to uh, an HCC campus. This is our HCC Grays Oaks campus. Uh, like Bill said, my name is Rami Brambat. I'm the director for Student Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And, uh, I have the, the privilege of having access to this campus and five other campuses in the area. Uh, that includes the Westfield campus, Dalton, uh, Grays Oaks, Missouri City, and Stafford. Um, you may or may not be aware that HCC is a really large school, uh, sometimes third, sometimes second in the country in number of students. Uh, so we get anywhere from 90,000 to 110,000 students a year. Um, we have some 79 buildings across Houston, over a million square foot uh, of space, and we spend about a million dollars a day. Our budget is $370 million. Um, so it's a, it's a fairly large school. And in the school, we have a variety of things that I'd like to eventually engage y'all in. Uh, everything from our procurement, which works with small business but, uh, owners in the community, to uh, corporate training, our, our, our corporate college, which allows you to upskill your employees using uh, TWC dollars, meaning Texas Workforce Commission will pay up to $1,800 of, of of money to upskill your employees and let's say social media, Excel, Word, PowerPoint, any skills, or a uh, current employee uh, up to $900. And to give you an, an, an idea, uh, the college, the class could be anywhere from $100 a person to $300 a person, uh, depending on what you want them to learn. Even if you want them to get their you know, PEP certification or something, the, the school offers. But the corporate college offers a lot of services to the, the business owners. So you can business with HCC through our procurement office. You can uh, upskill your employees through our corporate college. Or you could work with my office and uh, find uh, workshops like the, this with SCORE. Uh, we also offer some uh, technology workshops with our student entrepreneurs. We also have um, uh, business plan competitions. Where we could we could uh, you know, have to give you mentoring one on one with score mentors and others in, in the community, and then uh, give you access to funding for your business plans. So uh, those are three ways that, that on average people uh, business owners engage with us. Uh, this campus is our Grays Oaks campus. It's our workforce building. You're not going to see as many students uh, going here. Uh, this building is paid uh, partly by the management district and the Brazos Management District and uh, Houston Community College. So, um, uh, you know, we, we could, uh, we, we rent out rooms in, in other campuses. This one's a little restricted. But if you wanted to offer, you know, some sort of training or have a gathering, the campus uh, building, uh, the, the rooms are available for rental uh, through the, the campus manager and the first floor to give you some of that information. So my goal really is to just let you know HCC exists. Uh, we are doing a lot of wonderful things, uh, and uh, our students are also worth uh, considering to, uh, to be hired as apprentices or interns. Uh, we have students that are at least in my office. We've generated, we started 24 businesses in the past two years, uh, and these students are earning on average eighty thousand dollars in revenue for their businesses. So we've got some really cool, talented students that. That either you can contract or you could hire an intern and, or you could uh, employ. So uh, you know, check HCC out, or school up at HCC.edu. Thank you, Bill, for, for bringing this workshop to us. And uh, that little camera there is, is kind of recording this, so enjoy. Uh, this will be available to you later if needed. Uh, but also, uh, if, if you don't want to be um, you know, on that side of the room. But you're definitely being recorded. So thank you so much for being here. Again, the school is hccs.edu for more information. Thank you. Thank you. Does everybody know who and what score is? Okay, well, I've got a quick blurb anyway. We're 10,000 volunteers nationwide. 
There's over 300 chapters, Houston being the largest one in the United States. Uh, here we have about 125, 130 members. Our mentoring services are free. A few of our workshops do cost money like this one, but a lot of those are even free. The mentoring, if you didn't get a card and you want to find a mentor, there's a couple of ways of doing it. If you go to our website, houston.score.org, you can put in your questions or comments or what you're searching for and let us find you a mentor. That person will then contact you by email and set up something to get together. The best way really to do it though is you want to talk to somebody that's been there and done that, hopefully in the very same industry that you're in. I sold pumps for a living. So if you want to start a restaurant, I ain't the one to talk to. You. But we do have people that currently own restaurants and have in the past also. So you can also put in a keyword and do a search through our bios and find somebody with a little bit better background. Um, the, the main option, how many people have been into C score and talked to a mentor? We are free. Um, where else can you talk to a lawyer for free? I mean, think about it for a second. Or a pump salesman. I'd be happy. You know, I'm free too. But, <clears throat> we have 15 offices around the United States, Houston. The main one, main one's at Kessner and Southwest Freeway. The other, that one takes walk-ins from nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. Um, initial interviews typically take about an hour. So we figure out exactly what you want, what you need, and who you need to talk to. So if you want to come into Gessner, that's great. The other offices take, uh, or usually one man, two man jobs, and they, they take um, appointments. So um, like I say, we, we don't charge anything for our services. We're supported by the Small Business Administration, as well as a number of other banks. We're a 501. To, 503C or whatever the heck it is, uh, non-profit organization. So if anybody has any questions, I'll be here afterwards and can answer questions about um, a score. And I'm sure the Century 21 guys will be happy to answer any questions that come up too. So any questions right now? And we'll let them get going. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. And just a quick plug for score. So I started my very first business. I went to SCORE, they helped me write my business plan, think it through, invaluable service. Um, so that was the first company, now I think I'm on to the third or fourth one, but uh, you know, it was a good start, good basis, and I've continued to use some of those same things. Welcome everybody, um, my name is Kevin Vodder, uh, my partner in crime is Robert Chan. Uh, we are both with Century 21 Top Realty. Uh, we are a traditional real estate brokerage, so we help people, of course, buy, sell, and rent homes while also a commercial property. My background is in real estate investing. Um, I used to own a home investors franchise. Anybody knows that we buy big houses, billboards, and around town. So I used to own one of those offices here in Houston. Um, personally, I've bought over 150 homes. To date, I've probably, you count some of our clients that we've worked for, renovated over. 200 homes, um, I've wholesaled a bunch of houses, I know a little bit about it, I don't know at all, but uh, we, what we're going to talk about today is kind of uh, building wealth through single family homes and, and the model that goes with that. We're not really going to get into the fix and flip model, if there are questions about that I can certainly answer them, uh, but we're going to cover more single family investing. But just a quick show of hands, does anybody own rental properties today? And um, can we think about owning rental properties? More hands. Okay. All right, so let's jump into this. This is uh, Robert's in the back. He'll be here also to answer questions. And uh, my last name is, I pronounce it Vader, not Vader, but I'll answer to all of those. And uh, I don't have a son named Luke. <laughs> or, or if I did have a daughter, I couldn't name her Ella. Ella Vader wouldn't work very well. Um, but oh, and real quick, just a real quick plug. Um, today's kind of a big day for our family. Today is National Adoption Day, and uh, we just finalized our adoption of our youngest son this morning. So, uh, first to put that one out there. Since it's being broadcast live. 
All right, so who here would like to make more money? Anybody? All right, outside of playing the lottery and hoping that works out. Well, that's kind of one of the things that we do. We help people build wealth through real estate. So what does that exactly mean? So let's say you buy a home with a tenant in the property. What you're going to look at is putting, we say we put 25% down on that property, right? And we'll get into some of the things as far as owning that property and possibly buying it into an LLC as opposed to buying it in your personal name. Um, but the 25% down on a 15-year note. They don't want to know why 25% down. A PMI, good one. Um, make sure that your rent's going to cover your debt service. If there is a shift in the market, you're never going to be upside down really on that property. And one thing we can say about the Houston market, even through the Great Recession as we called it, we never saw our real estate prices fluctuate that much. We saw certain pockets fluctuate, but as a whole, our real estate prices stayed pretty constant. Now, things did slow down, right? We went from having a few months of inventory to having about 12 months of inventory on hand. And what does that mean? That if we sold, if we had to sell every house that was on the market, it would take you, at one point in time, it would take you 12 months to sell all those houses. Currently we run, probably running about four months of inventory. So right now it's still a very much a seller's market. A balanced market is considered six months of inventory. Who we'll wants to rent to cover the carrying costs, okay? So in 15 years, let's look at, see what this is going to look like. We have a property that you bought for 25%. Tenant paid it off for you, or maybe multiple tenants, right? We hope that you get one that stays there for 15 years. I've had some that have stayed for 8 and 10 years, but um, all the rent goes to you. Property is appreciated in the last 15 years, right? And the good thing is we're talking about appreciation on the entire sales price of that home not what you put into the property. So here's the example. You bought a house for 200,000, okay? Out of pocket, 50,000, that's at 25%. And to save some of you notes, we can email you this presentation and make it easier. Um, house now rents for 2,000 a month when you bought it. In 15 years. Looking at a house worth three hundred ten thousand dollars, so they get that number. That's three percent appreciation. Okay. Texas Real Estate Commission, Texas Association of Realtors, does not like me to use crazy levels of appreciation. We're going to use a base level of three percent. There are areas of Houston that will go up. I know areas of Houston that are going up eight percent a year, um, or have gone up eight percent. We saw shortly after. I don't know, 2010, 2012, 13, 14, where certain areas were really appreciating rapidly. So you cash flowed over 300,000, or, or 300,000. The total investment was 50,000, that's at 25% again. What next? So you have a choice. You keep renting that property, it's cash flowing pretty good. You've got a property paid off, it's grossing three grand a month. Probably after taxes and insurance, I bet you're still probably putting away. 22 to 2,500 a month, depending on what your tax rate is. Annual yield's going to be over 48 percent. You can sell it, and you're going to realize over 550 thousand dollars in profit. And that's what we're talking about when we're taking the collection of rent and the uh, the sales price into play. The total return on investment is going to be over 600 <coughs> percent. So how do you like them apples? Okay. Now, use the same example. We bought five houses. Now they're all worth over $1.5 million if we follow that $200,000 price point model when we purchased it. We sell them for $2.7. And what if you, uh, or make over $2.7, excuse me. And then what if you decided to keep them? Now those five houses are generating, are netting about $11,000 a month. That would not be a bad thing to walk to your mailbox every month and see those checks coming. 
Can we ask questions at the end? Or? Yes. Um, you got a question now? I do. Where are you getting your rent amounts from? Where am I getting my rent amounts from? Um, we're going to base this off of what the market rate would be. So, and that's going to go into a lot when you purchase that property. A lot of times when we're buying properties, I've got a formula that I like to use. I want that property, if I'm buying a $2,000, $200,000 property, I really want that property to rent for about 1% of the purchase price. I find that that is going to cover my uh, holding costs, that's going to do, handle my debt service, allow me to um, cover expenses that you know have to be handled with the property if something does break, and, and inevitably something will. Uh, but we want it to, to rent for about 1%. That rent should increase over time, just like the price of the property. And again, the projections are projections, right? You know, rent could be three thousand a month in fifteen years. It could be twenty-five hundred a month. On the other side of it, could be thirty-five hundred a month, depending on how that area has changed and redeveloped. Yes. Can we go back? I, I didn't really quite get the five hundred thousand dollars return number and six hundred. So what you're looking at, if you would take your rents collected over time, your total return on investment, that's going to be over 600%, but you've got <coughs> your profit is going to be your sales price plus your rent collected, because that is your total income, that is your gross profit over time. But you also pay uh, paying cost of those rent collected. Ah, uh, yes. You will pay, you've got, you're going to have a loan on the property, unless you pay cash for it. So, but the model here is to um, to leverage your dollar, not to. Are you taking it as a gross rent or as a net? That's the gross. That's the gross. That's the gross. Okay. Right. If you, if you adjust it for all the gain costs, this number will be way down. This number, you're probably looking at, if you had a $300,000 property, you're looking at, you know, depending on what your net on your monthly take, say it's a couple hundred bucks over what your debt service is and your expenses. Um, you know, that number would be over 15 years, you're looking at, let's just say, 2000 or 15000 30000 plus $250,000 in appreciation. You're probably looking at about $280,000 would be more of a net number that I would look at. Which is the real return. That is your, going to be your net return. That is correct. When we're talking about overall profit, that's going to be your gross profit number. So two very real numbers. One's a gross number, one would be a net number. Yeah. And maybe I should add a net number to the slide. Yeah, so but I'm, I'm not sure if, if the gross profit is the real number, but if that's good enough money in my pocket if I'm the investor to that pay over 15 years. Correct. The, the mortgage interest, the property taxes, the insurance. Oh, absolutely. And the maintenance costs. Absolutely. You are those going are to real, have. Those are real costs. You are going to have those costs, no question. Yeah. But when you look at your rate of return, and this is, I think this is the big point to make. If you're taking a property where you've invested $50,000, okay, in a $200,000 property, that property goes up 6%, okay, so now we're looking at a, I'm sorry, 3%, so that property now is worth $206,000. So if I take that $6,000 in appreciation with my $50,000 investment, I'm looking at a rate of return of about 12% just in appreciation of my cash invested, 12% rate of return on my cash invested. Now, that's not including any spread that you're making. Let's say, just say we made another $2,000 of net profit on rent that we're making. Now we're looking at a rate of return of about 16%, which is significant. Uh, when we're talking about, because the whole idea, guys, is to be a passive investor. Um, you know, take these properties, get them into your pool, um, you know, and work to acquire additional properties. And we'll get into another thing as far as management. I mean, one of the things we do is management, but my recommendation, whether you work with us or somebody else, is have your properties professionally managed. And it looks at me like, why, why do this? And I can tell you, I've taken my properties and turned them all over to my property manager. Why? Because what happens? I get to know my tenants. They have tenants. They know them on a personal level. What happens? Kevin, Kevin my child got sick. I'm going to be a week late on rent this month. What are you going to say? Okay. At least I did. 
and then the next month it's two weeks later, and then the next month it's a month later. Whereas when we manage properties, I'm sorry, the owner doesn't allow us, you know, we've got a strict policy that we abide by. It just makes it easier. And you, you can do that individually. You can say that I've got a policy and I'm going to do this. That may work, but most people are, are good. Um, so I would recommend man having a property managed. What is the typical or standard management fee? Managed, sure. Management fees vary pretty great. Um, I know some companies that will do it for a flat fee of approximately $100 um, a month. Yep. Um, other companies will be eight to ten percent. Just depends, and a lot of that will depend on the price point of them. I can tell you that, from our standpoint of a property management company, we are much more flexible if we've got a property that rents for fifteen hundred dollars or more a month, because we're going to get a better tenant in that house. We're not going to have the same issues. We manage begrudgingly a couple of properties that are. Sub eight hundred, some are five to six hundred dollars a month, and those are going to be the problems that I houses that I have the biggest problems with, from the standpoint of tenant turnover, repairs, um, other challenges. I mean, there's just a lot of issues there. We'll get into a little bit on kind of price point of homes and, and kind of our take on that as well. Let's jump back to where we were here. Um, so, you know, the whole idea here with your properties is you're trying to recreate that or create that reoccurring revenue stream, right? That's that's to me that's the reason you get into rental properties is to um, have that monthly income that's consistent. And as you increase the number of properties, and we we call you know the number of properties, the number of doors that you own, right? You know, door is one unit, but the number of properties that you own, you're spreading that risk around. And if I've got one property and it goes vacant, what happens to my income stream? It goes to zero. But if I've got ten properties and one goes vacant, I'm only down ten percent. You know, if they're all equal, and so you want to spread your risk around. And you know, owning more than one unit, I think, is is definitely the best way to go. Um, but you can use this as a nice retirement account. It could be something you could leave as an inheritance. And it says, what if you could buy ten rentals, fifteen, twenty? You know, those numbers are just going to continue to go up. Now we talked about why I have a property management company. Okay, we're all professionals in some capacity, right? The attorney, a plumber, electrician, a salesperson. We're all professionals. We're all good at our trade, right? We wouldn't do it if we weren't. We know how to generate income with our trade or with what we do as a for a living. Focus on what earns your income so that you can save up for your investment to buy your next property and then work to re to you know create that uh, investment opportunity again with a second property that's kind of my theory is you know I'm not going to go to my attorney to have my appendix removed you know let let the professionals handle that part of it just like you're a professional in what you do so just real quick on how do we work and how do we help we can help you find the house. Now, the key thing is, and this is not something that, or this is something you can do on your own. But you know, go out and look for the property. Make sure that purchase price is, or the rent price is about one percent of the price, the purchase price. That's the key. That's the formula that I go off of. And if I can beat it, great. <coughs> if I can get that house to rent for one point one percent of my purchase price, or one point two percent of my purchase price. No, I, I consider that a big win. Um, so if I can take that two hundred thousand dollar house and rent it for twenty two hundred or twenty four hundred a month, you know, I know I'm covering all my holding costs and I'm getting a pretty significant uh, spread every month on my income. And we can help you find the tenants. Now, the other thing is, again, we're not telling you these are these are things you can certainly do. The key here. Make sure you vet your tenants. Okay, do your background checks, both credit and criminal. Make sure you know who's living in your property. Okay, most landlords I know that are getting out of the business, they're getting out of the business because they had problem tenants. 
they destroyed the house, they broke the lease, they, you know, or it puts them in a situation where they had to get rid of the property. Okay, if you bet your tenants on the front end, nothing's ever 100%, but it will certainly ensure that you've got uh, good, stable people living in your property. And that's them not only background and credit, but more importantly, rental history. Yes, sir. How far and how possible is to find tenants? Well, it's a good question. Um, I can tell you from the standpoint of if we lease or we help you find a tenant, we'll, we'll help you lease the property. The commission is typically one month's rent. And so that is because there usually are two agents involved. Their, um, half of the month's rent goes to the listing agent. If we're helping you, we'd be the listing agent. And half of the month's rent would go to the tenant's agent. So it would be split evenly. It's 50 and 50. Um, but that's, that's pretty typical uh, across the board. Okay. And then, you know, whether we do it or somebody else, but you can manage your tenants. And again, you know, find somebody, find a property management company that can professionally manage your tenants and help you. And, you know, interview them. Yes? On the bedding of your um, tenants, mm -hmm. do you do that ourselves or is there a service company that we use? Help you? So, um, I mean, you can do it yourself. We use a, a program called tenantbackgroundcheck.com and, um, it sends an email to the prospective tenant to allow them to run the background check. But the big thing is we're calling that previous landlord. And I've got to have a verifi verifiable source that that is the landlord. I want to verify that you know the name they gave me is truly the landlord and not just a friend being a good reference for them. Um, but And you, you'll have a pretty good idea of that tenant when you do get that credit check back. Because that's going to tell you, and I, I should start adding one to the presentation of you know what that looks like when we do the background check. Because they'll tell you, okay, they didn't pay their cable bill, their, their telephone, their car, medical bills are outstanding. You know, what are we looking at? And, you know, I'll be the first to tell you that we will take some tenants sometimes that don't have perfect credit, but they do have good rental uh, history. Um, they've got a good job. And I can call the landlord and they'll tell me, oh, yeah, they were on time every time for the last five years. Well, I know what's their priority in life. Their priority is to pay their rent first. They may not pay the rest of their bills, but I know they pay their rent. And I've had tenants like that that have stayed in the property for eight plus years and always paid on time. But yes, definitely, um, you know, and get it, you can, they can even go to, I think it's freecreditreport.com and pull their own credit report. Uh, but then the other thing is you're gonna wanna do is, is get that criminal history. Um, and you wanna do it, um, probably both state and national, just to make sure you know who's living in your house. Uh, especially if you're in, if you own a home near a school or things like that, you don't want to get, uh, you don't, you don't want to have somebody in there that could, that could cause you problems down the road. You know, our big thing too is, and you can ask me one of our clients we work with, we collect the rent and then every month on the 15th they get a check, either we cut them a check or we send them funds uh, via uh, electronic transfer. Um, this is now, you know, you can have time to go find another investment property or retire and relax if you've got enough of them. That's, that's kind of our take. And, you know, we've had individuals we've worked with that, you know, have owned 20 plus rental properties and, you know, now they're comfortably, you know, sitting elsewhere in the world, you know, relaxing and not having to deal with this. We collect their rents every month for them. We take care of the hassle, and then every month by the 15th, we send them their check. So, um, those work. So, talk about how does this work? <coughs> this is for our clients specifically. And we meet with you, we assign you an agent, Robert back there, um, determine your search parameters, right? Because we've got. 20 people in this room, and every one of you is going to have different buying criteria. You may, somebody may want to be in Sugarland, somebody may want to be in the Woodlands, somebody may like Pasadena. Um, you know, so you figure out what you want, what type of property you want. We're going to give you some recommendations on where we'd like to see you buy. You know, my big thing is I love homes in a 
subdivision with an HOA that you know all the homes look consistently the same. We're going to recommend you buy a three bedroom, two bath, or four bedroom, two bath. It could be a three, two and a half, four, two and a half, four, three. But you want to make sure that you've got at least two bathrooms and I'd get a two car garage. Why? I know why. You want to resell it. Thank you. Right? Again, with the end in mind, you want to resell that property someday. When I've got a single family home that's a desirable home that either a single person, a couple, a family could move into, what have I done? I've increased my market. They can actually buy that house. If I go in and buy a one bedroom, one bath, two bedroom, one bath, or now a home we consider obsolete, a three bedroom, one bath, I'm going to limit who's going to buy that house, right? Because I'm not typically going to get a family of four that's going to be real happy about a three bedroom, one bath. Just not anymore. But, you know, in the 50s, that was pretty common, but uh, not today. So we'll work with you to kind of identify those parameters. Also, kind of go look at, uh, you know, we want to look at areas where maybe we've bought houses before, look at areas and look at time of rent, time on market, as far as how long it takes to rent that property. Um, you know, we want to make sure that the values in those areas are trending upward. We don't want to be in an area that's maybe on the decline, but we want to be on an area uh, that is going up in value. So, quick question. Does anybody know how cities grow, in what direction? Typically, if there's not a man-made or natural barrier, does anybody know which direction cities grow? Northeast, south, or west? Any guesses? Maybe all directions. They can go all directions, but they're going to grow in they're going to grow north and west more so than they will south and east. And we're talking about you know cities, and we can look at our city for example. Um, look northwest. Look at let's say Cyprus versus Pasadena. Where have we seen the growth? Right, the growth is look at Katy versus Channel View. Big difference in growth, right? Um, now we are going to see subsets of that, like Friendswood, Friendswood, and Pearland, but those are kind of their own city. Sugarland, again, its own city. But as a whole, if we look, the center of the metropolitan area, as we know it, it's probably moved a little bit further west because this is a few years old, but is the Beltway and I-10 West. They named that development over there city center for a reason, because that was the center of the metro area when they built it. The center is not downtown. So the, the city is slowly migrating west. And Why north. is that? I don't know the answer, <laughs> but, but I know that it holds true. We can even look at, um, for example, Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, if you'll go to Dallas, you know, Plano, McKinney, those areas are growing. Um, not as much south. They can't grow west because we've got Arlington and all the, the mid-cities there. Uh, go to Fort Worth and look at where that's growing. It's all growing west. Uh, we get out to California, you know, L.A. can't grow too much west. It's going to be right in the ocean. Um, but... Um, you know, we've got a mountain range or something like that, or a body of water that will stop it. A city will stop it. Um, more local example: College Station. College Station is growing south and west. You can't grow north because Bryan is to the north of the city. Um, but you know, that area is growing quite a bit. Okay. All right. So again, we'll work with you. We'll present properties that, that meet your parameters. You know, just again, we've done this a lot. We, we handle several hundred transactions in a given year. A high percentage of these are investment properties, and it's identifying properties in areas that you know we're seeing growth and appreciation. And then we'll assist you with the, the buying process, right? Making sure that you've negotiated the deal, you know what the market value of the home is. We'll give you a, we'll call a broker price opinion. Um, you know, we'll, Make sure all the contracts are filled out correctly. Uh, and kind of be, I guess, in a lot of ways as an agent, we work as almost like the, we're the coach of the, of the transaction, making sure that everything's done the right way. And then we'll assign a leasing agent to you to help you get that process leased if you, if you 
do something this day. And we'll find the tenant. We've had a lot of them. And then we can manage the property. So. And then rinse and repeat. So just a little bit about us. Um, I covered some of this in the beginning, but uh, we are one of the fastest growing brokerages in the city. Uh, we facilitate a thousand plus single family homes as far as purchasing them. Um, and this is going to be one of the things whether you're, when you're starting to look to buy a property, you're going to need proof of funds or a pre approval letter. And again, we're talking about leveraging your dollars. So if it's me, I'm working with a small bank, a local bank. Uh, if you do need bank contact, we certainly have some that we recommend. Um, but leverage your dollars, right? Because if I can go out and say I've got 200000 I can turn that into four houses, not just one. And the big thing here that we're looking at is not just what am I making net profit every month, but what am I making on the appreciation of those houses. Okay? And... Well, it's when it's ready to purchase. Decisiveness. Decisiveness because the good deals don't stay on the market forever. You've got to, you know, move quickly. And, you know, our job, again, is to guide you, is to not to push you to, you know, we'll tell you, I always tell everybody, we'll tell you to walk away if it's not a good deal. And I've had clients over the years that are like, no, but I want this house. I'm like, okay, I've said my piece. It's not a good deal. You still want it. Fine, I'm not, it's your decision ultimately, you can buy it, but, you know, we're going to make our recommendation, and, uh, but, you know, desire to build, invest and build well. What do you not do? Okay, and this is some of the things I'm going to recommend to you guys. Don't buy homes with extensive repairs. Unless you've got a contractor background and have renovated a bunch of houses, I can tell you, I found more surprises in renovating homes than I ever wanted to. Uh, we had one house that we bought years ago, and the contractor went to remove wallpaper, and when he did, he stuck his hand all the way through the wall. And we had a nest of termites in the center of the house from the floor to the ceiling. And I think the only thing that was holding it together is they were all holding hands, maybe, to keep the house upright. Um, but again, there were several thousand dollars of reframing and rebuilding that I hadn't planned on spending on that particular home. We don't buy homes at least for less than twelve hundred a month, and I wouldn't have a problem pushing that number up to thirteen or fourteen hundred a month. Um, again, our goal is to find a good quality, a stable tenant, buy in a desirable neighborhood that people want to live in, buy in areas that have good schools. Again, the more stable neighborhood, stable environment that we can buy in, the better off you're going to be. The more that house is going to stay occupied. Yes. So what does that look like for sale price or purchase price of the home? So, you know, again, we talked about that 1% rule. So, yeah. and where we're seeing now, home prices have trended upwards over the last, you know, 10 years for sure. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of the homes that we're looking at right now, you know, we're trying to find that fourteen or $1,500 rental in that $150,000 price point. So that 1% rule is where we're trying to be. And we've really got to scour the area to, to look for those houses. Because um, those aren't just, you know, always readily available. You've really got to look to find those and make those numbers. So you're talking about homes around 150000 not like 300000 No. So to buy a $300,000 house that leases for 1500 a month would not work. Um, and you'll find, too, that as homes go up in price, right, I'm not going to buy a $500,000 house that's going to lease for $5,000 a month. It typically does not happen. When we get to that price point, yeah, I can tell you I've looked at a lot of $500,000 houses and we go to lease them and they lease for 3000 to 3500 a month. And that does not fit the criteria for an investment, in my opinion, because your your debt coverage is not going to be what you need based on your income, your monthly income. So that price point that we try to stay into a lot of times is at 150000 to 200000 maybe 225000 kind of on the topic. Okay. Um, again, we don't buy homes in bad areas. If we see an area with a lot of graffiti, um, you know, cars parked in the lawn, um, again, I love homes 
in subdivisions that have an HOA that have these restrictions. Because that's going to protect the value of my home. I've been trying to understand what you are actually trying to help us by. Are you only dealing or trying to promote rental ready or rented property? Or are you delving into okay. distressed property foreclosures? Good question. Good, good question. Um, we've done it all. In this scenario, from the standpoint of buying properties, I would buy a property that either has a tenant in it, as long as the rents meet my standards, or that are very close to rent ready. Now, you know, there may have to be a make ready done, a paint carpet or paint flooring type deal, but we don't want to get into an extensive rehab property where you've got to go in and spend $30,000 to get that property up to standards. Um, why? Because what am I doing? If I'm doing a renovation at that level, it's probably going to take me six weeks, five weeks, depending on the contractor that I'm working with. And uh, and we all know that every contractor is 100% honest and always does the right thing and, you know, doesn't take shortcuts and doesn't run off with money. So um, I, I'm trying to eliminate those problems, get you in a property that is ready to go, that you can put a tenant in right away. It would just make, it'll start cash flowing right away without a lot of the headache. So you're not really buying discounted property, you really count on the rental income, cash flow, and the essential You know, we're, we're trying to buy a lot of those properties for about 90 cents on the dollar. If we can get them less, then we will we'll certainly do that, yes. But but the ultimate goal is, could I deal with a few blemishes here and there, you know, as far as I need to replace a stove or I need to do something to get that up, but we don't want to get into a, a situation where, you know, you're... Fifteen plus thousand dollars or ten plus thousand dollars, and and again, guys, if you are buying a property that let's say it needs ten thousand dollars in repairs, we want to make sure that after those repairs are done, that you've got a property that is still meeting the numbers that, that we're looking for. As far as you know, that's got to account into that cost basis of making sure that your one percent does include you know the one percent of rent. So you buy a house for one hundred ninety thousand that rents for two ten. Or 2100 you want to make sure that we're not having to go in and spend a bunch of money so that we're kind of out of our calculation um, but yes that's that's kind of where we're going Did that to answer your question yeah uh, we're just delving into this a bit to a few seminars it seems like a lot of the people we've been here and talked about the you know, after repair value so they're obviously looking at distress or discounted you know, you can. There are a lot of investors going after a lot of properties right now. And that's, that's a great question, right? It's very competitive because let's look at a couple things. Right now, there's not a lot of houses on the market, period. Um, you know, we're still in a seller's market. Now, we can talk about the market, and we do see a market shift coming. I, I think that's going to be uh, in the cards. But we find that if we're buying properties and in Let's just say the rehab properties, where you're trying to go in and buy them at a percentage on the dollar. You're going to fix them up, and repair. that market's up two hundred thousand dollars is very competitive. If I find a deal out there, there's going to be ten buyers for that property. Um, so, in that answer, no, I don't think there's enough uh, houses for the investors on the rehab side. Where we're really trying to say is finding a house maybe that's slightly below market that doesn't fit the traditional investor model, but still is a good cash flow property. Because in the long term, I can tell you, and this is speaking from experience, you know, having bought, fixed up, and sold properties, you know, I could make some capital today, but where have I made the majority of my income over the years? Is by holding on to those properties. You know, it's nice to sit back and look at a property that I bought 10 years ago and see what it's doing today. And consistently see that income coming in monthly. You know that makes me smile much bigger than you know making twenty thousand dollars on a flip. Um, so you know that's just coming from my perspective. Okay, good question. Okay. So talks about we do the work, and we kind of covered a lot of this. But we identify the properties, we evaluate them, we run the comparables with accurate rent comps. 
I'm your friend as long as I give you correct numbers. I'm not your friend if I tell you the house is going to rent for 2000 it rents for 1700 You know, we've got to be accurate on our numbers. Um, you know, and most of our clients are VP clients. So, you know, it's very important that I get you, or Robert gets you the right information up front. Um, managed purchase process, ensure the house is inspected. Now, that's a big one. Who here owns a house that they bought, just that they live in, right? Did you get that house inspected when you bought it? Okay, I think that's the best four or $500 you will ever spend in your life. Um, that's going to tell you exactly what's going on with that property. At least you've got a, one, you're buying a house that does need a little bit of work, you've got a plan of attack. But two, while you're in that option period, you've now got some ammunition to go back and negotiate. Well, the AC is near the end of its life. We need to get the condenser replaced, or we need to do something. And I can tell you that more often than not, we get the house inspected, we go back and we negotiate with the seller to get either additional price reduction or we get additional items repaired. Um, but always, always, if you leave today and you forget everything else we've talked about, always get a house inspected. Always. Investment property. The next home you buy to live in, um, make sure to do that. Okay. Questions. Now we've answered a few, but we're going to have. So before before uh, before okay. we get to questions, let me inject real quick and then add it on. Um, for those of you who just came in, my name is Robert Chan. Uh, this is not a get quick rich scheme. Like some of the seminars that you've gone, I've done this. Um, in the uh, real estate investment uh, programs, right, uh, national or local, uh, I've done this for about seven years. And uh, markets change, and he's right. The um, uh, the distressed properties that most of the investors are looking for is very little, and so what happens is uh, there's a very high com competition on getting those distressed properties. So instead of getting the right price. They go into a bidding war and the price goes up. So if you're thinking of applying the formula, ERV, right, after the fair value and the offer, it's not gonna happen. Uh, you have to be very, very close to a wholesaler or a real estate investor, and he'll find you a property and, and you get those distressed property. Now, like I say, we're not in that in that uh, area. Uh, but if you do have questions, we can answer because we've gone through the, that process. Uh, one of the things that I want to inject is if you're coming to, to buy a property right now, there's a sweet spot, right? The rents no lo no lower than twelve hundred dollars. If you do your calculation, the property is no no more than a uh, hundred thousand or fifteen hundred thousand. Um, the sweet spots are right now, and this is not. It's a case-to-case -case basis, but I'm in the field, so I see properties, and their property ranges between 200 and 400, uh, kind of the sweet spot because you can still rent for what 20, 22, 24, and the uh, 400,000 people would still go to about 4,400, 4,500 uh, per month. Okay, so those are the sweet spots. It also tells you uh, what the economy is. Uh, engineers are coming in. How much do they pay? 80,000 household? And so all that research has been done uh, by us. We know what are the sweet spots. Then comes to area. So area is where I go in the field and you let me know what area you want. And we find it for you. We, we'll do a research. Uh, the best way to do it is focus. Focus where you are. Focus where you want. Don't go all the way like from Galveston to, um, I don't know, Conroe. It's too big. Focus on what in area first if you're just started. And then after that, once you get experience, you know how your finances are, um, then you can expand more and more. So that's that's one of the ways. Uh, the, the other thing is there are other sources of funds. So lending, pre-approval letter, choose your lenders wisely. We recommend not go with the national, like rocket mortgage. Uh, go local, 
somebody that you can do face to face, handshake, and you can call and you speak to a person on the phone that you know. That's how we would uh, uh, advise you to do. And if you don't know anyone, that's uh, property. And we go into the property. So if you we find you a property or you find a property and you say, okay, is this a good property to buy? Well, if I was going to help you, I go very detailed because I've flipped homes before. I've helped clients and I know the trend of what these properties will go for. They are marketability or what we call exit strategy. So in seven years, 10 years, 15 years, you want to sell. Is that property uh, worth more than other properties? So we select properties that's away from high power lines. Um, sometimes we go into the layout. Sometimes we bought houses before as soon as you open the front door, it's like you feel something is not right. It's the layout. Okay. Uh, if you don't know about that, I can help you on that. There's also another point that, that I learned from uh, from a long time ago is Feng Shui. And so there's, there's energy flow in some of these houses. And I'm not going to go into details right now. But keep in mind, these are things that when you want to sell a house, you've got... Uh, Buyers that comes in, and you want that house to be attractive, okay. Uh, and and lastly, lastly, basically, I, I come back to get funds. Make sure you have you have talked to your lender and know how much they can lend you, because that's very critical. Uh, once you know that, then we can work on that numbers to uh, find you a uh, uh, some hopes. Okay. Uh, I will distribute my card, but. Please go ahead and questions. So one of the other questions though that I had more so is if you're starting off and you're trying to figure out where to go and start to rent, what are some of the questions we should ask ourselves about identifying an area to target? Well, um, I think I would start off first looking at school districts. Okay, find an area located in a good school district. Um, Again, it goes back to we're trying to bring in the biggest audience that we can. If I've got a good school district, then I've got families wanting to move in those areas. Okay. Um, also, find homes appreciate a little bit faster in a good school district. So, again, we're playing that appreciation game, right? We want to see those values go up. Um, again, I would also look at where that property is situated in the city. Is that in a growth track? Am I seeing, you know, how are the roads getting to that property? Is it accessible? Is it easy to get to? Um, you know, those are just some of the basics that, that I would look at first. But, and how's that neighborhood trending? Trending upward? Is it trending downward? Um, because not all areas and not all neighborhoods are created equal. Um, but, you know, get a feel for that area. Um, and then, I mean, the thing with Houston is we're so big and we're so diverse and there's so many jobs throughout the city, you know, it's it's, it's hard to find an area of a high concentration of jobs, but, you know, you can look at areas, I think, that are redeveloping. You know, you can look at, you know, we know cities grow north and west, but we can go back to kind of near east, just east of downtown. Um, you know, we look at areas like Fifth Ward. Fifth Ward is on the track to be redeveloped and regentrified. You know, and I can tell you being in this business for close to 20 years, 20 years ago, we never would have thought that area would be an area of redevelopment. Um, so, you know, we wouldn't have thought Midtown would be an area of redevelopment 20 years ago. And look at what it's become. So try to find those areas that are starting to redevelop. Uh, when you look at Spring Branch, has really changed over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, Look what's going on in Cyprus right now. 290 is about to be finished. I live in Cyprus. I don't know if anybody else is excited about it, but um, but our commute times are getting ready to drop significantly. So once that happens, I look for us to see a bump in the real estate market out there. I mean, it's already growing I'm crazy, but uh, that's one of the fastest growing areas. So those are things that I would look at. I know there's a lot of them, but we try to take into consideration a lot of factors going on. With us. Yes, sir. If you were to uh, manage a house or a pool of houses as a management company, obviously you charge a fee. Yes. Would you almost guarantee the continuous tenancy of 
of the house if one tenant leaves, we immediately find the other one. Um, we make sure that you know there are no defaults in the rent and all that. We can't guarantee it. I don't know that a single property management company will guarantee it a hundred percent. But where I am comfortable is we'll vet those tenants on the front end to ensure that we're not getting. And again, and I'd have to evaluate your portfolio first because at what price point home are we talking about here too? Because you know if you're telling me, oh, I've got the best eight hundred dollar rentals in the city, I'm going to bid you good luck with those. But no, I'm, I'm assuming that I'm buying the home to you. But yes, as for your advice in the neighborhood where you advise, we've had at the price point where you advise. Yes. You know, so every step I'm just following your advice. We've had very low turnover in our property management company. Again, I managed eight properties that were supposed to be a six month management deal. Happened four years ago, we're still manage them today. Uh, those are my problem properties, and those are, like I said, those are the sub thousand dollar market. And we do get a fair amount of turnover in those, nothing we can control. Um, but our properties that do fit that criteria that are fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars a month or more, we've had little to no turnover. I think we've only had um, two broken leases in the last five years of management. So, yeah, very low. Yes, sir. You said a minute ago with the always get a get an inspection. Yes, sir. You said you were with a price reduction or something else. Uh, or getting the, the seller to make repairs. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. We sure do. Um, I mean, almost always that happens unless we've gotten really contentious in negotiations and we've hit the sellers just bottom, bottom line and can't get them to move anymore. We usually get something done. We'll hear it back. What are your ideas on obtaining tenants who have housing choice vouchers? Okay. Um, we lease a lot of properties to tenants that have housing vouchers. So, is everybody familiar with housing vouchers or Section 8 rentals, as we call them? Um, there's some good things about renting to Section 8. One, the tenants incentivized to keep up the home because they don't want to lose that voucher. Okay? If they're not a good tenant and take care of the house and make sure the house is in good order, uh, then um, they, they stand a chance to lose that voucher. So that part's good. Also, uh, we've had uh, vouchers that have actually paid above what market rent would be in certain areas. Uh, when we would take a four bedroom home and uh, we'd have it for lease for eighteen hundred, or a voucher would come in at eighteen forty, forty dollars more. But still, that's another almost five hundred dollars a year uh, that that voucher paid. So uh, we were able to do that for the, uh, and then it's consistent. That comes in every month. Now the one downside to a housing voucher, I think, it's about a month delay. It takes a month to get started. It's the Processing of all the paperwork does take a little bit, but once it's in place and they pay on time every month, but I think the first month is usually a bit delay. So um, we've had good luck with them. Uh, and my landlords, I've got certain landlords that understand them and get them and really like them, and I've got other landlords that just tell me, no, we're not going to deal with it. So that's their choice. Okay, yes, sir. I yeah, I did a quick calculation. Let's say you're able to buy a home for. $200,000 in Stanford or Border Park of Richmond, you can't buy anything for $200,000 in Chicago. No, probably not. Right. Uh, let's say if you buy for $200,000 and the rent is $2,000, you know, the property tax, the mortgage payment, the insurance, the HOA fee, all of the totals to roughly about $750 to $1,800. Yes. I included that. Yep. So it, it just gets me about two hundred dollars a month, <laughs> and on an annual basis, this is just one percent. That's going to be one percent of your cash flow. But again, what we're looking at here, and this is so you're paying. So you're doing a couple things there. And then you're a couple things that you're not accounting for. One, you're paying down that mortgage every month, and let's say you pay down that mortgage. I don't know the first year, maybe a hundred dollars a month. Okay. You know it's going to be low. Maybe you're cash flowing two hundred dollars a month. Okay. In addition to that, you've got your appreciation of that property. 
that property is going to appreciate at the rate. So when we start looking at, let's say I pay down the debt, I'm pulling in 200, and I've got, and again, we'll use that 3% because if we look at it over time, properties have been beating across the board at 3%. But if we're, you know, some months or some years, maybe they're a little flatter than others, and then other years they may jump 5%. Okay? So that same $200,000 house, I've got $3,600 a year between paying down the debt and a couple hundred bucks a month, plus another $6,000 in appreciation on that $200,000 house. So now I'm at $9,600, just using kind of rough math, on a $50,000 investment. I still have that asset there. So you know, doing quick math, what am I about? 19 20% return on my investment. So 19.2, I think, percent. So again, that I don't look at that as a, I look at that as a pretty solid investment. Can I take $50,000 and put it in the stock market and get that? Now, right now, that's a whole volatile question. But yeah. um, but can I do that consistently? And again, I'm not going to look at this, you know, over one year. But if I look at it over three years, and also, and let's not forget. I may run into a year where I've got to replace an AC or I've got to replace a roof. But if I'm hitting, let's not use 19, let's use 12, 13, 14. If I'm hitting that consistently, I can sacrifice and make those repairs when I, you know, I need right. to. Because I'm not going to make those repairs every year. It's a long-term building strategy. It's not something that... This is not a... Yeah. yeah, this is not an overnight, and this is not a, um, you know, TV show where you look at three houses and you buy one. So it, it, doesn't even done replace, it. it doesn't even replace the ongoing income, because let's say even if I buy houses, each one is netting me $200 on a cash basis, bringing me $1,000 a month. I cannot live off on $1,000. Correct. So i got to continue what I'm doing to make a living. This is just my future. This is this is an investment strategy. This yeah. is a long-term investment strategy. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're I mean, unless you've got you know several million dollars in the bank that you need to put to work somewhere, then you can kind of look at that as an option. But you know, as a whole, the whole idea is to you know, it's just like being in the stock market, right? I consistently invest a few hundred dollars a month over you know 20, 30 years, and this is what I've got. And I think this is a little bit accelerated because we've got a timeline on our note. You know, if we're looking at a 15-year note and you know seeing these rates of return, um, you know, I always joke with my uh, financial advisor and like, you can't beat my rates of return in real estate. And he can't. Yeah. I mean, he might one year. But that's a fluke year. But consistently, he can't. You got questions in the back. But even after the 15 years, when the mortgage is gone, you just lost all of that, right? You do, okay. yeah. You do. So, minus minus your tax and insurance and yeah. expenses. Um, my question was originally you were talking about possibly buying an LLC versus. Uh, thank you for bringing that back up. Yes. So, one of the things that I would look at, and so you can, I know you can buy investment properties through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac through a conventional mortgage, but you're going to be required to typically buy in your personal name. So my recommendation would be to talk to a local lender, talk to a local bank. I know, I think Allegiance Bank has been pretty good about real estate lending. Um, we've got some contacts there. Um, some of the banks are obviously more friendly towards real estate than others. Uh, I talked to my friend at Frost, and he only even talked to me about lending on real estate. Uh, but you know, talk to um, talk to a bank that's willing to work with you. If you're putting, a, you know. A decent down payment work to put those properties in an LLC. Okay. Um, if you've been to court, I've been to court and had a company that I own sued. As ridiculous as it was, I was still sued. But the plaintiff tried to name myself and my wife as we walked into court as part of the suit. Well, it was against my company. My attorney quickly said, scratch them. And the judge threw them out right away. So, putting that in an LLC will provide you some protections. Now, again, I'm not an attorney, but it will help you from the standpoint of your liability. Um, I think the determination is how many properties would you want to put in an LLC. You know, is it 
maybe putting five in an LLC and then you know opening up another LLC. You know, it just depends because right because every asset that's in that LLC is subject to you know a lawsuit if it does happen, right? If somebody walks across your property, trips, falls, breaks their leg, you know, what are you liable for? And you put one or two in a LLC and then form a new one. I mean, you set up an LLC for about what, twelve, fifteen hundred bucks? Three hundred. You do it through um, legal zoom. You can find it for less. Yeah, you can. Go ahead. We have something we call a series LLC. Now, yeah. Where you can link like one company and then each house can be done as its own LLC. Yes. And they individually have their own liability. They want to call it the company. There you go. And uh, yes. And I'm not an attorney, so um, for me to offer legal advice would be a lot of trouble, but uh, like score one shot. there you go. <laughs> and do that. Do what score recommends. Yes. And then I think we have a question there. So if, if you buy the rent in a personal name, is the interest on our mortgage tax deductible? Um, yes, because it's an expense. It is an actual expense. So it is. Even though it's an investment home, not a homestead. Correct. But it is, it's not, it's a deduction against your income, right? Okay. So you're looking at, if you pay $3,000 in interest, that's going to be an expense that you're going to have against the rental income. Yes. Okay. You also get depreciation. And you do get a depreciation. That is one thing that we haven't really talked about at all. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, yes. There's a question over here. So I was going to back up a little bit yes, in reference to you, when you think about buying a property, is there a way you can find out uh, how old a house is, for example, so you will not be buying it and within a year it has to replace the AC, uh, you know, all those major appliances. So, uh, it, it, can you help us with that? Well, a absolutely. So a lot of that, you know, is public information too. One, we'll always know the year built of the home. Okay, that's recorded in the tax records and everything else. It goes back to that in inspection. Um, you know, when we go look at a property, let's just be honest, and let's just say that all of you are buying your own home, right? And we set up a day with you to go look at houses. And we go look at eight houses over the course of four hours. Okay, the reality of it is with drive time and everything else, we're probably spending about 15 minutes in a house, maybe 20 if you like it, 30 if you love it. But as a whole, you know, we're not spending a whole lot of time in those houses. An inspector's going to go in and spend three to four hours, you know, checking every blood. Okay, does that work? You know, checking water pressure, checking the roof. Um, sometimes they're using uh, thermal imaging cameras to see if there's insulation in the walls or there's leaky pipes. I mean, now I will tell you, not all inspectors are created equal. So, you know, find. A good inspector, find one that actually does a level check of a foundation. Not all of them will do that. Um, some of them will just say, you know, foundation does not seem to be functioning as it should, get an inspector. Others will go out and actually do the level measurements on the floor to tell you where it's off. That's what I prefer to see. But the inspector's going to tell you this air conditioner was installed in 1992. Well, ACs last about 15 to 20 years. And start that one probably needs to be replaced, okay? Um, but that's where I think it goes back to getting that inspector real. And we'll do a lot of that too on the front end. You know, I've walked into houses many times, like, oh, this foundation feels off. Or, you know, we start looking and there's cracks in the bricks and there's cracks in the walls. Or we look at the roof and there's curling of the shingles. And, you know, or we open up the attic and realize that I've still found some that have the uh, cedar shake. Uh, roofs underneath the shingles, and that's a whole, you know, tear off and you know, redeck and everything else. That's quite an expense, but you know, we'll look for a lot of those things. Would uh, inspection be done quickly? Because you know, if it's a good house to buy, you've got to well. So you're there. okay. So that's a great question. So what you're going to do, and then let's we'll step back to the, the the process. One, we're going to identify the house, and by our initial investigation, we're going to say this is a good house to buy. You're going to contract it for a price. Okay. In the state of Texas, you have an option period. Now, an option period is your feasibility period. That is your time to get the house inspected. You've already agreed upon price. We use that $200,000 house as an example. You've agreed to pay $200,000 for that house. 
you say you get a 10 day option period or seven day option period. During that seven to 10 days, you're gonna have an inspector go out to look at that house. You've already locked the house up essentially legally. So they can't sell the house to somebody else because you're under contract. Now, during that option period, you still have what I call kind of your get out of jail with a small fee card because you can you have the unrestricted right to terminate that contract. And I come to find out that is um, not in all states. I have a brother that's a realtor in Wisconsin, and they don't have an option period. You contract the house for a price. You get the house inspected. If there's major issues with it, the seller has a chance to cure them. If they don't, only then can you break out of the contract. Here we could wake up the next morning and like, you know, that was really a bad decision that I made buying this house. I don't want to buy it. No reason whatsoever. I can terminate it as long as during that option period. So uh, get it inspected then, and then we know a little bit more about the house. It does happen very quickly, but a lot of your inspectors will inspect the house. They inspect it today. They'll have the inspection report in your email by tomorrow morning. Yes, sir. Um, would it be a good idea to, because I know inspect, home inspectors don't check for, for termites, so the termite, do you do So um, typically a lot of inspectors that I've worked with will say, do you want a termite inspection? And they'll bring out a uh, pest control person to do the inspection right away. And it's about another, I don't even remember, $75, $95 to have a house inspected for termites. But if you are looking at your house, and you're wondering if you can go home to your house today and look, Termites, make sure that around your house you can see four to six inches of slab. That is your best defense against termites. Um, and look for, these subterranean termites will form a little mud straw. It looks like a little mud tunnel on the side of the, the slab. And that's their tunnel into the house. Typically it isn't a weep hole. You've got a brick home, it's a little uh, small groove between the bricks on the bottom of the house. And they'll tunnel in there. You've got a pier and beam house. They'll tunnel. They'll build a tunnel up the side of the cinder block. But they're pretty easy to identify. Uh, the um, oh, what's the the other type of termites? I forget the flying ones. Those are a little bit harder to detect. But uh, I think you can look for them. Yes. It's compared to single family homes, uh, you know, what would you advise about townhomes and condos? Okay. If you have I do. Um, I would strongly recommend a single family home every day of the week over a townhome or condo. Townhome or condo, you're going to have a monthly maintenance fee. Um, that's going to increase the expense basis of your owning that home or owning that particular property. Um, traditionally, also, we see single family homes appreciate faster than townhomes or condos. And pretty much year over end now, again, you can go out and I'm sure and look in Houston and find an exception to that rule, uh, possibly in Montrose or somewhere in there that's redeveloping or continuing to develop, I should say. But as a whole, your single family homes, day in, day out, will uh, appreciate that. Good question. Um, well, so that's a whole different animal, um, but a good question. Multi-unit, it's going to depend. Now, your it depends on the price point of that multi-unit. Because I mean, I know you can find, and we've had some, you know, on different parts of town where we've been able to buy some eight, ten, twelve unit, four unit, well, four units really just fourplex, but um, let's just say six to twelve units. And we've had some that have cash flowed real well, but in certain parts of the city where I've been able to buy those, appreciation is not very good. So I've got to really bank on that monthly income to, to generate that income. So when you also look at multifamily, you know, you can quickly jump to 30, 40, 50, 100, 150 units. And, you know, the, the challenge you have there, you jump, you know, the more you jump up in price, the fewer and fewer buyers you have. So, um, what I like about single family is I get consistent appreciation, and then I've got an asset that's very similar to cash. If I need to liquidate that asset, I can liquidate it pretty quickly in most cases. And not, not to mistake, so single family category is one to four doors. Yeah. So it's got to be a full plan. Yeah, that's correct. 
get a question back there, please. I have a question about like starting capital. So you are you recommending a mom or a bit in your experience of you know like a bottom line like you need hundred K or fifty K? You know, um I would look at it from the standpoint of what purchase price are you trying to, to buy? You know, I mean, I really like to see 25%, but kind of the minimum threshold would be 20%. Uh, as long as you've got a bank that's willing to work with you on 20%, a lot of, because it's not your primary residence, uh, a lot of lenders are gonna want 25, maybe 30, depending on your credit worthiness. So and if I'm looking at starting out with a $150,000 home, you know, I'm looking at, you know, probably, uh, you know, on the low end, 30000 and it could be just a little bit more than that. So that's, that's where, you know, I'm trying to start with as far as capital needed. Now, I probably have a little bit in reserves just in case something breaks and I'm not going, you know, negative or I'm not, you know, I don't want to be in a situation where, you know, I'm in uh, the negative uh to start out with or having trouble with that property up front. Yes. So what is the you know sweet range where in terms of rent and value where you go below that rent it's not gonna work out because it's either the value uh, or the tenants will not be a good quality. Mm -hmm. And above that range, you know, the pool would be too limited to be able to rent it short sure. because when you when you cross the twenty five hundred dollar range to get renters at that price is very difficult because Anybody who is able to pay $2,500 rent will also qualify for a mortgage of his own. Well, you are co potentially correct, um, but not everybody wants a mortgage. Keep in mind that you know we are a growing city. We've got people moving here all the time. Um, you know, and we've kind of shifted a little bit because used to we'd have people come here and like, oh, well, let's help you buy a house. Now we've kind of said, well, do you want to rent a house for a year, kind of learn the city? Learn where you want to live, what you want to do. You know, most of the time people are not moving from an area that's quite as large as Houston, so they have no idea what traffic and commute times are. But where I like to see rentals is that fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred dollar range, and that, that is truly where we like to stay because those are pretty rentable, rent ready. Now there are certain parts of the city. If I get more inner city. You know, Rice Military, Museum District, Montrose, that if I can find the properties. Now, that's a whole different valuation because now I've got people that want to live in an area so bad, they'll pay X number of dollars to buy the house, but the rent rates aren't quite equal to where I need them to be. But in those areas, you know, I can justify a little higher price point rent, um, especially if you can get into, like, Memorial School Districts or, you know, uh, some of the better inner city schools. And I can quickly justify a thirty-five hundred dollar a month rent, but what's that purchase price going to be? And that's the, the bigger challenge that we're going to have. So I'm in that one fifty to two hundred fifty thousand dollar, fifteen hundred to twenty-five hundred dollar a month rent. That's where I like to be. Yes. So you'll have access to lists where individuals don't are delinquent on their taxes. Um, I don't know if I I try to find a list out there. Um. I know we can get lists for individuals that are late, like 90 days late on their payments and things like that, but um, the listeners can subscribe to the breakdown demographics. You got it, of course, behind the computer. Yeah, you, you can, you can do it by state, county, zip code. You can find them, but I don't know about what's your pay taxes. Yes. Uh, what about rent down properties? Okay, um, rent home. Now, in the state of Texas, we work with another company that does a rent home type scenario. You've got, you can do a rent with the option to own, but it can only be for a three year period. So, um, after three years, you're not supposed to let somebody buy that property. So, if they're renting for three years and that three years goes buy and they don't exercise the option to buy and uh, they lose so I'm coming back to uh, tax uh, so for closehouston.com if you subscribe to them you can get multiple lists so tax foreclosure list and also mortgage list they may have other ones 
that, that that's just one of them. But that's going to be foreclosures. That's not just going to be individuals that are delinquent on or late on their taxes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, late on. So late on taxes, no. But once the property has already been gone through, like Lion and Burger, you know, some law firms, it's already going to the foreclosure. Uh, I tracked that for a couple of years, and the trend, the trend kissed the investor side. They cut you before it gets to the foreclosure. So if you go to the foreclosure, tax foreclosure, you see a list and this and this for what, eight precincts, and you go down there and you see on the day itself, it's like they go there and scratch, scratch, scratch. So at the end of the day, instead of like a thousand properties, it goes down to like 50 properties, and you're bidding with multiple investors. So it's, you may get a chance, yes, but the chances are very slim. So I was just really talking about taxes. Every home mm -hmm. that I purchased, I've done foreclosures. I've mm -hmm. never purchased a home just outright, and I always get a foreclosure that has equity in it. So that when I purchase it, there's always equity in the home. That's good. If, if you have a technique of doing it, a process of doing it, all the better. Yes. Any questions? That's some good questions this afternoon. Lots of good questions. Very good group. We appreciate everybody being here. Uh, I think Robert handed out his cards. So if you guys do have any questions, please let us know. What we'll do is we're going to get the um, list that you signed in with SCORE, and we can email this presentation to you to review. And um, you know, certainly let us know uh, if you have questions. I mean, we're always, you know, part of what we do is to try and you know, help educate community, help educate other potential investors. Um, we've done this a long, long time, and uh, I think some of my properties have attributed to all my gray hair. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, it, it's certainly been fun. Real estate is something I'm very passionate about, something I love doing. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm the broker now, and I don't get to go out in the field as much as I used to, but you know, I could go look at houses all day long and uh, you know, not get tired of it, so it's, it's a lot of fun. But uh, Thank you guys so much for being here. We sincerely appreciate it. And uh, we'll stick around if you've got any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, so you talk about a mark issue. Yes. Is there, oh. Is there any prediction? Right the mark issue. Yes. So, if anyone wants to listen, I, I, it's, it's interesting right now. We're seeing a couple things. One, we're seeing a little bit of volatility in the stock market, right? We're seeing some ups and downs in the stock market. Anybody's paying attention? Um, interest rates. Any idea what's going on with interest rates to buy a property? Up. They're, up. They're up almost a point from uh, beginning of the year. So being in Houston, we've got some other things going on, right? So as much as everybody likes to say we've diversified over the last 20 years, and we have, uh, we're still heavily dependent on the price of a barrel of oil. We're seeing the oil go down. Um, so I don't know this is going to be a long-term situation. But um, we have seen the market kind of, over the last month and a half, slow a little bit. That's not necessarily a bad thing because we were in such a seller's market for such a long period of time. We need to get, I think, back to a balanced market because if you're going to look for a home today, you'd like to have four or five options, not one that you've got to bid up and pay more than you wanted to. And so, you know, those are some of the things. I think we'll get back to a balanced market. The election, the midterms, which were quite popular this year, and we had some quite heated races. I think that solved us a little bit. And then not to mention that we've had, what, about a month and a half of rain. So even if that only affected us a few percentage points, I still think that made a few more people hesitant to go out and look on a wet, rainy day. So we've had some slowing, but um, if I'm projecting, I think interest rates will be a factor. But when interest rates climb, that usually creates a sense of urgency for buyers. Like, oh, I've got to buy it five and a quarter percent and not five and a half percent or six percent. So that does create a little bit of sense of urgency, uh, but it also does affect the amount of home that somebody can buy. Um, but I think we will get back to some sense of normalcy, but a lot of it's going to be dependent upon the price of uh, a barrel of oil for us locally. Uh, so, you know, we'll see. But all in all, I am not one to predict doom and gloom. I think we'll see our balanced market, but we're not going to see a buyer's market. I think it's I'm just curious to thought about the inventory, because what I saw over the summer, 
stores, like an increase of seven thousand in the little houses. Just simply post harvesting the ads, what has become of the market, and all that might do. Yeah, um, but it seems very soft. It seems very soft at the high end. It's going to be well. It's going to be soft. It's always softer at the high end, right? It's either extremely hot on the high end or it's soft, and it doesn't seem like it's ever there's middle ground. Um, I'll tell you what did happen after Harvey, and one that makes all the sense in the world that I didn't think about was the month of uh, September came around. What happened to rentals? The funds hit the market. And you had a house on the market, it wasn't ready. Because one year to the date of Harvey, or maybe a year and a week or two after they'd gotten into a rental, you know, those those individuals were moving back into their homes or they were, you know, purchasing a home or they were doing something different. And so we had a lot of rentals come available. So, you know, that definitely did increase. And we're seeing that kind of work its way out, right? Will those rentals be occupied? Um, we are seeing Inventory, sales inventory tick up a little bit, but again, it's not crazy numbers like we saw in 2008, 2009. That was an operation. That was, um, now that was the time to buy rental properties if you were buying in nine or 10, because you could buy a $1,300 a month rental for $85,000 all day long in certain zip codes, and you could get them rented. And it was just, uh, I wish I would have had a spare sort of million dollars to buy real estate at that point, but I didn't. So, or even a hundred thousand dollars to buy real estate. But, uh, so, but, um, but I think our market's going to balance out a little bit. We may see it slow a little bit through the holidays. I think we'll pick up and have a pretty strong spring. But typically, if you're looking for properties, competition is a little bit lower right now uh, through about February, and um, then March kicks off our selling season. And, um, June is the busiest month of the year for real estate transactions, followed by July. Uh, May is busy. Um, everybody wants to know when I go on vacations when school starts because it is crickets in our office when school starts back. Nobody's buying a house. Anymore. Everybody's trying to figure out the new normal of life for schools. So, uh, but. Does Century 21 have a forecast on the end of our upswing and the potential for a recession? I mean, we're on a seven to eight year. You know, we've been on a what, seven to eight year recovery. So, um, but it's, you know, we, we talk about that, but at the same time, if we look at our local market, you know, when we went through the so called Great Recession, Houston only had one month where they really dipped. I mean, we weren't exactly going gangbusters, but we weren't like um, Florida. California, Las Vegas. And I'll tell you, those are the markets to watch. You start hearing news about the Florida real estate market crashing or Vegas going uh, down or California prices dropping, that, that'll be your indicator. Um, you know, and, and it, I don't know that we're gonna see that right now. But uh, I think we're seeing a little bit of a slow where we've gotten the elections behind us, midterms even though they were uh, I think we'll see things steady out a little bit, but I'm not seeing us go through what we did in eight or nine, ten. What goes up? What's going Let's just hope it levels off and not goes down. So what did you say when we kick off month March? March is when we start to get busy, oh, okay. and we stay busy through um, through school starting. And it's funny we'll we'll have we'll be busy. The month of August, but September is very quiet for us. Do we get busier for you towards the end of the year? Because December is traditionally a good month for, from the standpoint of transactions. Yes, especially on the commercial side because you get a lot of companies if they're going to make a move or spend dollars, they want to get that transaction closed before year end. So we love it on our commercial business. That's Christmas. Yes. What do you mean by sales market the way sales market right now? So seller's market um, means that we're, so I do it based on inventory. Right now, in current inventory, it's about four months? Four months. Okay. So four months is considered a seller's market. Okay. And what that means is we were to sell every home on the market at the current rate of sales, it would take us four months. I see a balanced market at six months. Now some people will tell you six to nine months. 
I don't know that I like nine months, I like six months. Um, I consider it a balanced market. Uh, but anything above six months, then I really start to look at that as the buyer's market. Meaning, there's a lot of inventory on hand. If you're looking to buy a house, you've got a lot of options. And now we're getting sellers kind of competing to get properties sold. And in some situations, if like we saw in 9, 10, you know, we were seeing 12. Do we see? Did we go to 14 months? I don't remember. The 12 months? No. 12 months of inventory. And that was very much a buyer's market. So it would take us a year to sell through the entire inventory. And I mark, my oldest son was born in November of 2012, and I kind of mark his birthday to that is the that month was the shift in the market when we saw things just turn and uh, the end of 2012 and then 13, 14, and 15 went gangbusters. So, all right, thank you. All right, thank you guys. Appreciate it very much. <laughs> Oh, out there, yes. They don't let me influence your answer. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. You're telling Okay. Okay. Well, I've got a guy. Uh, Yeah, it's um, 45, 50 close to a place. So right oh, right.